previously on the American Justice Podcast. And uh, also, so I'm uh, producing a documentary about the Brandon Woodruff case. And uh, I sent you a, uh, sent you a, uh, I sent you a, uh, a request to ask uh, some questions of you. Um, is it, can you sit down for an interview or like, can we talk about the case? Is there any, Judge Aiken? Is there any, is there anything that we can talk about that case? I mean, what, did you infringe on his constitutional rights? Oh. Huh. Guess you didn't like that. There is an epidemic in America's criminal justice system. The prosecution and conviction of innocent people for crimes they did not commit. Welcome to American Justice. The American Justice Podcast Army works to free men and women wronged by the criminal justice system. It's not only about the innocent who have been imprisoned, but also the victims of the crimes as well. No one deserves justice more than them. And now, here's your host, Scott Pogansey. Hello, AJ Army. Welcome back to your podcast. Last week, we talked all about the Sixth Amendment violation committed by the Hunt County District Attorney's Office. Needless to say, if you have an airtight case, there's no need to go on an illegal fishing expedition. Turns out, apparently the prosecution's case wasn't as airtight as they made it seem to the family and friends, at least the ones that would listen to them. This week, we're going to learn why that one violation cost Brandon his freedom forever. Even though the judge recused the Hunt County DA's office and appointed special prosecutors from the Texas State Attorney General's office, the effects of that violation would journey way past just an ethical mulligan. There are no do-overs when it comes to curing the taint of depriving a defendant of their constitutionally guaranteed rights. It's one of those things like trying to uncut your hair. Once the stylist cuts that one part of your hair a little too short, there's no going back. You can't glue the hair back on. All right, let's get started. Just for a time reference, the Sixth Amendment violation happened towards the end of the summer of 2007. It was ongoing all throughout July and August and September of that year. The judge initially ruled that there was a Sixth Amendment violation but that the Hunt County DA's office did not act with malice in their violation of said United States Constitution. I'm not really sure how you violate someone's rights without malice, but again, this is Hunt County, Texas. I guess maybe he just meant that this was an everyday run-of-the-mill constitutional violation and not an especially egregious one. <laughs> I I would hate to see what kind of intrusion Judge Beacom would deem malicious. Anyway, so there we were. The Hunt County DA's office was still assigned to the case. However, something happened, and it's not really clear from the record, but eventually the DA's office realized that they really shouldn't be on the case at this point. In a motion to Judge Beacom, on October 2nd, 2007, they basically explained that they felt like that if they were able to garner a conviction, that the appeals courts would not look favorably on the state continuing to use the very office that violated Brandon's constitutional rights in order to prosecute the case. So in that motion, they asked to be recused. The judge said that the DA's office wanted to be recused, and Brandon's attorneys wanted the DA's office recused, so he felt like this would make everyone happy. Well, you know, except for the innocent person sitting in jail. But really, who cares if he's happy or not? Judge Beacom 
finally signed the order on November 6, 2007. So there goes the Hunt County DA's office into the sunset. And here comes the Attorney General's office special prosecutors riding into town on old-style western horseback. Well, one might think, okay, it might take the state a couple of months to get their ducks in a row and get the special prosecutors up to Hunt County. So Brandon waited and waited. Ralph Guerrero, one of the special prosecutors, did not take his oath to prosecute the Brandon Woodruff case until September 23, 2008, some 10 months later, while Brandon was just sitting in a jail cell on a million-dollar bond. Okay, I said all of that to say this. I'm not trying to rehash last week's episode, but it's important that everyone understands the timeline of all of these events as we move forward. All of these delays caused by the Sixth Amendment violation allowed for the reveal of the most controversial subject in this case, the sword, or the dagger, or the knife. No one can really make up their minds as what to call it, or how big it is, but don't worry, there's a reason for that, and we'll get to it. On June 12, 2008, Brandon's Aunt Kathy was going through some boxes in the barn behind the Heath house to get it ready to rent out. She found something that rang a bell in her head. She found a sword that was kind of medieval looking. It had a skull head on the handle and it looked like one of those swords that you would use in a show about King Arthur when the valiant knights would charge into battle. The handle was 6 inches long, and the blade was almost 12 inches long. So all in all, from tip to tip, it was about 18 to 19 inches long. To give you a little visual, imagine the average man being 6 feet tall. This sword, leaning up against his leg to the ground, would be a bit past his knee, almost to mid-thigh. If you're listening to this via podcast app, I would strongly urge you to head on over to YouTube to check it out there. I'm going to play the video of when the police came over to seize the sword over the next bit of narration. I'm not going to play it here on the podcast because it's all visual and the footsteps going through the tall grass would make for some pretty boring listening. So head on over there to check it out if you'd like to see the actual video. Kathy said this sword was in a box wrapped in some plastic along with some other items. If you remember back to earlier in the season when we talked about Brandon's timeline of that night and the events that the state theorized Brandon had to have done, this is one of the items that Brandon would have had to have done in the short 14 minutes that he was, quote, unaccounted for. It wasn't like this sword was hastily thrown back behind some other boxes. It was wrapped neatly in some plastic and placed carefully in a cardboard box. We'll get to why that's important in just a few minutes, but I want you to know that by the end of this episode, I will have proven to you beyond any doubt that this sword found in the Heath barn on June 12, 2008 was indeed not one of the weapons that killed Dennis and Norma Woodruff, even as much as the prosecution wants you to believe that it was. Here's Brandon's trial attorney, Catherine Ferguson, describing finding the sword, a.k.a. dagger, a.k.a. knife, a.k.a. alleged murder weapon. She opens the door to what we'll talk about in a few minutes as well, the whole issue of whether or not the sword was in the barn the whole two years before it was found. Here you go. The barn at the at the Heath residence or the garage, whatever you want to call it, that building, 
was was very definitely cluttered. I mean, there was a lot of stuff in there. But I think this goes back to the fundamental, what I accused uh, the law enforcement of just basically being lazy. Uh, I, I think I would remember questioning them and being kind of a smart aleck, asking them, well, do you know how to use a broom and a dustpan? And are you familiar with glad trash bags? Because they were just saying, oh, it was just so cluttered and we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that. And I'm like, my client's on trial for the rest of his natural life, where he's going to live, and you're telling me it was just too much of a bother for you to do a thorough investigation, but you want to lock my client up for the rest of his natural life? I mean, I, I've, again, I kind of find that suggestion offensive, that, well, you know, you're expecting us to do too much. No, I'm expecting you to thoroughly investigate and not just sit back and say, we've solved it, we know who did it, we're law enforcement, take our word for it. Because they very frequently get it wrong. I mean, they're human. And so the barn was very, very definitely could have been searched. And this whole question of was the dagger sword there uh, could have been, and was it in fact in a box with a bunch of other knives, that all could have been addressed uh, at the time of the investigation. And Again, the fact that the knife, the size of the knife kept changing. You know, oh, it's this little dagger. I'm sorry. Nobody in their right mind, I would think, is going to call something this long a dagger. That's a sword. That's not a dagger. A dagger is this. And every description without fail from his college roommates and everything was, oh, it's a dagger. I feel like it's fairly important to recap those activities just so everyone is clear. I've heard from more than a few people that following Brandon's timeline of that night is a little confusing when hearing about it in just audio form. Let me see if I can sum it up in a neat little box so it's easier to remember. The long and short of it is that Brandon had to have left the Heath house to get to the cell tower he pinged off of in Mesquite by 10.27 p.m. It takes 23 minutes to drive from Heath to Roy City. So 10.27 minus 23 minutes is 10.04. In order to get to the Heath house in time for the next door neighbor, Randall Lunds, to see him, quote, between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m., he had to have left the Roy City house by 10.04 p.m. Had to have. Since the state never theorized that Brandon was making and receiving calls while he was shooting and stabbing his parents, the last known call to Brandon was 9.50 p.m. So 9.50 p.m. to 10.04 is exactly 14 minutes. So again, just to recap, Brandon had 14 minutes to do all of the following, according to the prosecution and what we know about the evidence at the crime scene. First, he would need to shoot both of his parents a total of four times, put the gun down and pick up the sword and stab both of his parents a total of 14 times. Now, go to the bathroom to clean up, take off all his clothes and put them in a plastic bag, set the bag off to the side, jump in the shower, and wash himself so good that he would not get any blood on the towel that he used to dry off with. Then he would need to put some new clothes on, clean the bathroom so well that no blood or any DNA was ever found, and somehow do this while not getting one drop of blood on himself or his new clothes. Then he would have to levitate over the blood that he just dripped on the carpet all the way to the bathroom in order to not get any blood on his shoes or his feet, then head over to the kitchen sink to clean off this 18 to 19 inch sword. This had to have been cleaned off in the kitchen sink because the bathroom sink would have been way too small to get the whole sword underneath it. All right. So now you have a bloody gun, a bag full of bloody clothes, a newly cleaned off sword, 
and the shower curtain all in your possession. What do you do with all of this? Okay, got it. Let's drive to the Heath house and get rid of everything. I mean, that makes perfect sense, right? Let's drive from one house of my parents to another house of my parents just to drop off the murder weapon. Okay, so we don't include the 23 minutes to drive to Heath, but once he gets to Heath, he has to go to the barn in the back of the house, move about 100 boxes out of the way so he could put this sword in a box on the bottom of the pile, and then move all 100 boxes that you just moved back on top of the box that he just put the sword in. And then, now that one of your precious murder weapons is hidden, it's time to go back out to the front of the house and move mom's truck out from in front of the trailer. Then, get out of her truck, go back to your own truck and move that one in front of the trailer, and then get back in mom's truck. No time for feeding the animals or anything because we still have a shower curtain and a gun and a bag full of bloody clothes to get rid of. All right. On the way to Denny's, we'll just stop and throw all of this stuff over the overpass into the lake below. It just doesn't make any sense. First of all, anyone that thinks that the most trained and disciplined assassin could do all of this in 14 minutes is just delusional, let alone a 19-year-old gay kid that, by all accounts, didn't even know how to operate a gun. Second of all, the state wants you to believe that Brandon was so calculating and he had this so well planned out that he had the sword and the gun hidden in the Roy City house just waiting for the opportunity to pounce, along with a bag that he could put everything into as to not get any DNA in the trucks. But yet, he never planned out what he was going to do with the gun? Come on, people. Are we stupid enough to buy this? No, we're not. And it's just unfortunate that the defense team couldn't discover or realize everything I just told you in order to present it this way to the jury. I realize that hearing it now, the way that you just heard it, makes it sound impossible. But when the prosecution makes it out to be like Brandon had over an hour to do all of this, and the defense just doesn't really dispute it, it becomes a little more clear as to how this jury found it plausible. Okay, so now let's think about how long you think it would take to move all of these boxes over, plant the sword, and move all of the boxes back on top of the bottom box he just put the weapon in. In order to put this into perspective, I'm going to play a reenactment from the trial when Catherine Ferguson was cross-examining Detective Bobbitt as to why they didn't search the whole barn for their murder weapon. This is actually something that has always bothered me. Let's look at it from the investigator's standpoint. You have a witness, the next door neighbor, Randall Lunds, that says without a doubt, 100% that your number one suspect Brandon Woodruff, was at the Heath house between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. the night of the murders. Why on God's green earth would you not search every square inch of that property for a murder weapon? It's not like it was a 250-acre property that you just would have had to have had a thousand volunteers from the community to come help search. It was just a normal suburban house and a normal-sized barn in the back. The police tried to say that it was just too cluttered to search it completely. Here's Catherine Ferguson having none of it. In this reenactment, she's cross-examining Brandon Bobbitt of the Hunt County Sheriff's Department. And Mr. Guerrero asked you that some areas of the barn, quote, unquote, were inaccessible. Yes. They weren't accessible only because you didn't make an effort to gain access. Isn't that correct? Not necessarily. Well, was there a locked door to keep you from getting in the barn? No. Was it just boxes on the floor piled, stacked up in a pile? 
There were boxes on the floor. There was debris in the stalls to the point that debris almost overrode the stalls. Did that debris weigh two to 3,000 pounds? Collectively, it's possible it could have. All right. Was it all glued together in one big lump? There was a lot. All right. Do you know how to work a broom? Yes. And a dustpan? Yes. Do you know how to fill trash bags? Yes. So if you had wanted to gain access to those stalls, you could have done it? Yes. Did you see anything in there that would have made it physically impossible for you to inventory the contents of the barn October 22nd, 2005? I don't believe it could have all been done on October, on that specific day. Okay. It may have taken a day or two, correct? Taking everything out and going through every single thing, it's... it's possible. All right. So is it your testimony that you and the other officers just couldn't be bothered to take a day or two to search the barn? At that time, we were in the barn. There was such debris and stuff in the barn. I'll ask you again, investigator. Is it your testimony that you and the other officers could not be bothered to take two or three days to inventory the contents of the barn? I said no, we didn't search the barn then. And there was no reason other than you didn't want to get in there and climb around in the barn. There was no reason to physically prevent you from doing that, was there? I don't believe that was my decision. I believe that decision was made by the lieutenant who was on the scene. Your answer is you're just following orders? Yes. Do you not take some initiative in your investigations? Yes. You have a little bit of discretion in how you conduct an investigation. I'm telling you, we didn't search the barn. Did it ever cross your mind that it might be important to inventory and search that barn? Yes. But you just didn't do it, did you? We didn't search the whole barn, no. Well, if I remember your testimony correctly, you didn't search it at all from what you just said earlier. Isn't that true? I believe that's right. So you're here as a detective or investigator with the sheriff's office to give evidence against this young man accused of murdering his parents. And you're telling me that because someone else didn't tell you to search the barn, you didn't do it? Right. Well, didn't you say earlier no one told you to do it? I said was that... You weren't ordered to search the barn. Right. In other words, you didn't do it because no one told you to. Yes, ma'am. So there you have it. The barn was just so cluttered that the Hunt County Sheriff's Department couldn't be bothered to search it completely. This is just one more incompetent element to this capital murder investigation. Okay, if the barn really was that cluttered, then Brandon would have had to have moved dozens and dozens of boxes away to put the sword in the bottom box and then move those dozens and dozens of boxes back on top. I mean, Investigator Bobbitt sure made it sound like it was stacked floor to ceiling, didn't he? But however long you think it would take Brandon to do that, we need to deduct that from the 14 minutes that Brandon was unaccounted for. Still, remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Your Hunt County Sheriff's Department couldn't be bothered to search the premises of the last known and confirmed location of your number one suspect, but they're going to charge him with capital murder and take his freedom away. Forever. Let that sink in for just a minute. All right. So the next thing we need to talk about is the size of this weapon. If and when you ever read the trial transcript, you'll notice the prosecution keeps calling it a dagger. And when Eric Gentry talked to Ranger Collins just two weeks after Dennis and Norma were found dead, he described it this way as well. Let me play the clip that I played for you in episode 18 about how Eric describes this dagger. Remember when I played it for you and then told you to put it in your pipe and we'd smoke it later? Well... We're about to smoke it. Here you go. I notice you've got a pocket knife on you. I do. Right there. You want to see it? Yeah. Has he, did Brandon, have you ever seen him with any knives no. or anything? No, uh, not like pocket knives. Brandon worked at Medieval Times this summer, mm -hmm. which is like, uh, you probably know what Medieval Times yeah. is. Yeah. Okay. And so he... Because he did horses and he worked with the guy and he had this 
dagger kind of medieval looking dagger and he brought that to school and had it in the closet and from the limits of looking at the closet I've done I haven't seen the dagger in there and I thought probably the police took it when they came when's the last time you seen it uh, a month or two ago probably um, how big was the dagger probably I mean of six the blade six the inches blade you was think? probably probably six seven inches and then the handle four or five so it was a good. So overall, it was about almost foot, a yeah. foot. Yeah, big knife. Yeah. Pretty big. It, yeah, it was, it was like a medieval looking thing, and uh, I thought it was fake at first time touching. It. it was real. What do you? What about the width on it? You know, I mean, um, maybe maybe an inch and a half. Inch and a half on the blade. width yeah. on the at the thickest part. Yeah, at the blade, and then down to a point. Okay. And uh, but y'all could have knives here, I guess. Right. Well, I don't know that he was supposed to have. I think there's a rule on the length of the blade. But yeah, if um, that was over. If that's six inches, that's yeah, over. I, but I you're was, allowed to carry a pocket knife. Like right, this. you're allowed to carry a pocket knife like this. Okay. Under that length. Uh, but you hadn't seen that dagger in a while. No, I hadn't seen it in a while, and uh, I guess it was just kind of a friend thing that I never said anything. Just like the snake, you know, like it was just, right. I never thought something like this would happen and it would be an issue. So right, well, and we understand that, yeah. and we're not, you know, you're not in any kind of trouble. Yeah. So there you have it. It's a dagger. Plain and simple, it's a dagger. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone says the word dagger, the image that comes to my mind is exactly what Eric is describing. Something with about a six inch blade with maybe a four or five inch handle. Definitely under a foot. But I mean, something that you can wield in one hand and flip it around real quick. You know, like they do in the movies. We'll get to the actual description of the sword that was found in just a minute, but when witnesses are questioned right after the event happens, and then they're questioned over three years later, the interview done right after the event is most certainly going to be more accurate than anything else that you're going to get from them later on. Now, no one is disputing that Brandon owned a medieval dagger. In fact, just as Eric had said, Brandon worked with a man named Marcial Contreras at medieval times here in Dallas the summer before he went to college. As we've mentioned before many times in this podcast, Brandon loved working with his horses. Because of this, he literally walked into medieval times and just asked them, hey, I really love working with and training horses and I was just wondering if I could come work with you guys for free just to gain the experience. He ended up talking to Marcial, the head horse trainer, who said, sure, come on down for a few times a week and I'll show you all about what we do and you can see if you're interested in it. Well, turns out Marcial gave Brandon a medieval dagger as a thank you gift for helping him during the summer. So I went into full private investigator mode and in January of this last year, I was able to track down Marcial Cantores. I have to tell you that when he agreed to meet with me, it was very surreal. By the time I found him, I had done a lot of research about who Mr. Cantores was, and let's just say he was a legend in the horse training circles. Somewhat of a celebrity, if you will. Now, by this time last year, he was already retired and enjoying his time relaxing. So when I went to meet with him, I was super excited. I was excited to meet him, of course, but once and for all, I was going to find out whether or not the sword found in the barn that fateful day in 2008 was the dagger that Brandon owned. Of course, I was nervous a little because if Mr. Contreras said yes, absolutely, that's the sword I gave Brandon, then it would just shoot everything out of the water that I've heard from Brandon. So I arrived to meet with Mr. Contreras, and after a very lengthy conversation, the moment of truth came. I pulled out the picture of the sword that the state used as exhibit number 149 at trial. 
He laughed almost immediately and just shook his head. He then wrote out the following affidavit for me. I, Marcial Contreras, swear under penalties of perjury that the information in this affidavit is true and correct. One, I have personal knowledge of the facts stated in this affidavit. Two, I have not been compelled or threatened to sign this affidavit in any manner. Three, I am signing this affidavit knowingly, voluntarily, and freely. Four, I fully understand the contents of this affidavit, and I read, write, and speak English. To wit, here I say, this exhibit 149. I have never seen this sword in my life, and I do not remember Brandon Woodruff owning it. I never saw this sword, much less gave it to him. This inscription on the sword says made in China, and all swords and daggers that medieval times came from Spain had never had this kind of inscription. This sword was not ever sold at medieval times, and I did not give it to Brandon Woodruff. The dagger I gave him was for training horses, and was much, much smaller than this sword. So there you have it. Whether or not Brandon ever owned that sword cannot, of course, be ruled out for 100% certainty. But we can rule out that it did not come from medieval times, as the prosecution alleged. Don't worry, we'll get to that in trial as well. Just one more thing the prosecution would present to the unsuspecting jury that just simply was not true. But don't worry, those episodes covering the trial are coming up very soon. Next week will be the first one, in fact. So back to what Eric said. It was absolutely true. Brandon did help out medieval times and he did own a dagger. However... The extraordinary thing about this was that Eric's description of Brandon's dagger was spot on. It did have a 6-inch blade and approximately a 4-5-inch to five inch handle. In fact, let's just hear it straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> no pun intended. Here's Brandon. They kept trying to attribute that sword to me through medieval times. Um, in trial, the state throwing out the fact that I had a check written to medieval times. But because the state nor my attorneys really went into more detail, the jury never got to hear that that check was actually for two general admissions, which was me and a friend that had went to medieval times. That sword was not from medieval times, and that sword was not mine. Mine um, actually had a little bit, it was a lot smaller and it actually had a Medieval Times logo on the sword. And I didn't even call it a sword, I called it more like a dagger. Um, that was like more of a training aid for my horse. I had one Andalusian that knew how to bow, he laid down, he knew how to rear up, and I used it as a training aid, like they do the horses in Medieval Times. And so it was more of a prop than anything. It was not that sword and it was not near as big as that. This brings us to the wordplay that the prosecution tried to use all throughout trial. They kept calling the weapon that was found in the barn a dagger. But I can guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, this thing was not what I would think of when I heard the word dagger. Most of us would think about exactly what Eric described. Conversely, let's let Catherine Ferguson tell us about the size of this sword. The size of the knife kept changing. I mean, this was this was kind of the uh, you know, like those sponges that you drop in water and they get bigger and bigger. The knife continued to grow. The dagger continued to grow. It went from a something that had maybe a six-inch blade and a three-inch handle to now this 
foot and a half long sword, uh, double edged. You know, the size kept changing to fit whatever it was the prosecution wanted. They talked to the roommates. Oh yeah, it was only about six inches long and da 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 da. Then they find this knife that's, or again, a dagger or sword that's this long and say, oh, well, that was the dagger that Brandon must have had. So you know, things just kept shifting and changing to fit. So the size of this blade was around a foot long, and the handle itself was six to eight inches long. So now we have a sword found in a barn two years after the murders, after Brandon's been in jail all of that time that is almost twice the size as Brandon's best friend described. And of course, the state yells from the mountaintops, they have the murder weapon. So this is where the state starts trying to get smart. They realize that this sword found is much bigger than the one described by Eric Gentry. So they start calling it a dagger. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not let the prosecution distract us. I don't know anyone that would describe a weapon that is almost two feet long and so heavy that you have to hold it with two hands just to pick it up as a dagger. But the state of Texas did. You know why they did? Because Eric Gentry described what Brandon owned as a dagger and not a sword. So if the state started calling it what it is, a sword, then it would not match up with what Mr. Gentry said. And that would be a big problem for them. Solution? Let's just start calling this huge medieval sword a dagger. No one will ever catch on. Well, guess what? We caught on and it was absolutely shameful. All right. Before we get into the forensics of the sword and why it could not have been the murder weapon, Let's talk about why the state, and eventually the jury, was so convinced that this medieval-looking sword belonged to Brandon. As soon as the detectives seized the sword, they sent it off for DNA testing. I mean, it makes sense, right? Right. Finally, the investigators did something right, even without the aid of the heroic Texas Ranger Jeffrey Collins. Remember. He had moved on at this point, and the investigation had pretty much halted. But when I say right, I mean that in a whimsical sense. Kind of like when you would tell your nephew that struck out for the third time in his Little League game that he did a great job. The investigators did something that can only be described as suspicious. Imagine you have a capital murder in your county. Two innocent people were shot and stabbed in their home. And all of a sudden, someone calls you and says they have what might be described as the murder weapon. You go over there and you pick it up. Now, what's the first thing that you might think to do with it? I don't know about you, but my first instinct is going to be to send it off for DNA testing to see if my suspect's blood is anywhere on it. I mean, I would do that like yesterday, as soon as possible. You know, like immediately. What does the Hunt County Sheriff's Department do? They waited 16 days to send it for DNA analysis. 16, one, six. Like two weeks and add on a couple more days. Hunt County Sheriff's Detective Tommy Granfield took the sword into custody on June 12, 2008. The DNA report from the DPS lab says that the sword was hand-delivered to their office for testing on July 3, 2008. That, ladies and gentlemen, is 16 days. Maybe I should mark this up as a win for them since it took Ranger Collins over six months to ask for the phone records in the case. 
The innocent explanation for this is that it just took them a while to get all of their paperwork in order and search warrants and court orders in order for them to submit this for analysis. But even then, the detectives that I've talked to in Hunt County say, at most, the paperwork should only take a couple of days. Judges are readily available to sign such orders, and it takes only an hour or two to prepare the paperwork. So then one has to wonder, what would be the more sinister possibilities? If they wanted to make sure that this sword was tied to the murders, all they had to do was take a couple of tiny drops of blood and plant them somewhere on the sword. That's it. I'm not saying that that's what they did. I'm just saying that it's difficult for me to wrap my head around taking 16 days to send the supposed murder weapon off for DNA testing. I just don't get it. All right, so on September 26, 2008, some three months later, the Texas Department of Public Safety finally came back with their report. The hunting knife and corresponding sheaf had come back without any DNA on it whatsoever. But the medieval sword came back with a very small amount of blood on it, no more than a couple of specks. But they were able to extract a DNA profile from that small amount. It was Dennis Woodruff's blood, which made sense since it was his sword. Here's his own mother, Bonnie Woodruff, describing that situation. They cleaned the house out several times and they brought some of that stuff out. I don't know, some of that stuff might have been brought back, but I do know the sword was found in a box, a box of knives, which I firmly believe was my husband's knives. He collected knives and he gave all of his knives. He sold a few of them, but he gave them to Dennis, my son. And that sword was found in that box of knives. And that shows to me that could have been my husband's knife too. And that would be why Dennis's blood was on it and why the mother's blood was not on it. Yeah, it seems kind of, if you're going to use a weapon to stab you know, two people, that if there's going to be any blood, it's going to have both. Yeah, it's Dennis came by and got all those knives, but I don't know what all was in there. Right. there was, but there was a knife collection. It was a knife he, collection, and, he, and it was in a box of, that was wrapped up in bubble wrap, they said, in top of those knives. But all that was brought out, all they said in court, but it did say out of a box of knives, was they found a knife wrapped in bubble wrap. That don't mean nothing. So is it that far-fetched to think that someone that owned a knife or a sword would have cut himself on it and accidentally left some blood on it? Of course, that would be the explanation if the Hunt County Sheriff's Office did not plant the blood on it. But there's something very suspicious about there only being Dennis Woodruff's blood on the sword handle. Dennis and Norma were stabbed a total of 14 times. Nine for Dennis and five for Norma. As I've described before, this was a horrendously bloody crime scene. There was blood pooling all over the bodies and the couch itself. There was blood spatter all over the blinds behind the couple. There was blood dripping off the murder weapon or the suspect all the way to the bathroom. This crime, by all accounts, was one of the bloodiest scenes in recent memory. There had to have been Dennis and Norma's blood all over this weapon if it was the one that was used. And when blood is mixed together, it doesn't just magically separate into two distinct beads of blood. No. It's just like any other liquid when mixed together. They commingle and they stay that way until separated by a microscope. So if this had been the murder weapon, they would have found both Dennis and Norma's blood together on the sword. Think about it this way. 
Next time you're out to dinner and you're drinking water and the person beside you is drinking tea or Coke, each of you take a drop of your drink and put them on the table right on top of each other. They're going to combine into one drop of tea water. Now, try to go and separate them back into one drop of tea and one drop of water. It's just not possible. So again, if this was the actual murder weapon, the DPS crime lab 100% would have found both Dennis and Norma's blood. Period. End of story. No question about it. Okay, so the next thing we're going to get into is going to be a little bit out of order. I'm going to explain to you the elements from trial when the forensic pathologists testified. It's going to be a little bit wonky, but I feel it's very important that we cover it now so that when we get to the episodes covering the trial, you already understand wholly and completely why this was not the murder weapon. Plus, it'll help out with those episodes because this information is so forensically intense, it will hopefully make the episodes about the trial a little easier to follow. But let's just suffice it to say that when I'm done in a few minutes, you'll understand completely why the state had to lie to the jury to try to make this sword the murder weapon. All right, so let's be honest. I can sit here and tell you all day long that Brandon says he didn't own anything like this sword, and Eric's description was way off on the size, and it was in a barn that was already searched, even though not thoroughly, but already searched, and they didn't find anything, yada, yada, yada. But many of you are still going to be sitting there thinking, Scott? It's still at least possible that it belonged to Brandon and that he used it. Well, luckily for us, we have a little thing called forensics. I'm about to prove to you, forensically, that the sword that was found in the barn was not the murder weapon. Period. And then I will drop the mic. Well, maybe not drop the mic. These mics are pretty expensive. Maybe I'll just put in a mic drop sound effect. There you go. That's what I'll do. Okay, let's get started. Please stay with me through this because it is a little bit technical and maybe a little dry, but it's very important. The first witness that we'll talk about is James Nichols. He was the DNA analysis expert with the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab. He was the one that performed the DNA testing in this case. He didn't really talk about very much that was of importance to the case other than to say that Dennis's blood was found underneath the skull on the handle of the sword. Ms. Ferguson asked James if he knew how the blood got there, and of course, he did not. Ms. Ferguson asked him if it was plausible that the blood got there from Dennis having cut himself at some point and then grabbing the sword with a bit of blood on his hand. After all, The skull was right there at the point where someone would grab it with their hands to pick it up. This is also important because he testified that DNA does not go away after time. So if Dennis would have cut himself in, let's say, 2002 and they found the sword in 2008, any blood that he transferred would still be there unless, you know, it was washed away with magic water, as Miss Ferguson so eloquently pointed out. As we talked about earlier, it is physically impossible for someone to take two drops of blood, say Dennis and Norma Woodruff's blood, and separate them with their bare hands. In addition to this fact just being common sense, Mr. Nichols agreed to it as well. The last thing that Mr. Nichols pointed out was that there was no DNA found in the bathroom or hallway wall but we'll get to that more when we cover the trial. Next, 
The state calls the two forensic pathologists that worked for the Southwestern Institute of Forensic Sciences. This is the agency that houses the Office of the Medical Examiner. They were the two that performed the autopsies on Dennis and Norma. In smaller towns in Texas, and probably most everywhere, they contract out to the departments in the bigger cities that have a much higher case volume to do their autopsies and forensic analysis. It's just much more practical and a lot cheaper when you only have a few dozen suspicious deaths a year. Here's how their website describes their office. The primary function of the Dallas County Office of the Medical Examiner, OME, is determination of the cause and manner of death for those deaths within the jurisdiction of the office, generally, sudden and unexpected deaths occurring in Dallas County. The OME also serves as a regional forensic pathology resource on a fee-for-service basis, primarily serving smaller jurisdictions operating with a Justice of the Peace death investigation system. Approximately 1,400 autopsies are performed for other Texas counties annually. So the two people that the state called to the stand, the ones that performed the autopsies, were Dr. Lynn Salzberger and Dr. Sheila Spotswood. To summarize what I'm about to tell you is that there are three things that forensically prove this sword was not the murder weapon. The width of the blade, the cut patterns, and the bruise marks. Let's start with the width of the blade. Both Dr. Salzberger and Dr. Spotswood testified that they did not measure the width of the blade on the sword. In fact, Dr. Spotswood said this time when she saw it in court was the first time that she had even seen this weapon in real life. She was basically just looking at pictures of the sword when estimating whether or not it could have been the murder weapon. When Dr. Spotswood was on the stand, she admitted that she was not able to forensically tell whether or not the sword that she was now holding in her hand was the murder weapon. She did, however, measure the width of the stab wounds. The widest stab wound is one and three quarter inches. Now, you might be wondering, how wide is the sword that they alleged is the murder weapon? And your curiosity would be right on point. The blade on the sword was two and a half inches wide, a full three quarters of an inch wider than the widest stab wound. Let me put this in kind of an easier way to understand. There's no way that a blade that is bigger than the stab wounds can make a smaller opening than the width of the blade. So if this had been the weapon that made the stab wounds, the openings would be at least two and a half inches wide. In other words, it's possible for a smaller blade to make a bigger wound, but it's not possible for a bigger blade to make a smaller wound. Now, you might ask yourself, what if they just didn't stick the blade in all the way? If you have seen the pictures of the sword that we put up on the website, you will see that the blade comes to a point, and until you get to about three inches up the blade, it doesn't come all the way to its fullest width. It kind of tapers up. Well, that would be true, but it brings us to our next point of contention. Around some of the stab wounds, there would be what they call hilt marks. This is when a knife is stabbed all the way into someone that it causes a bruise around the stab mark where the handle hits the skin. This causes a hilt mark or a hilt bruise. Some of the holes where the knife went into both Dennis and Norma had these hilt marks around them. They would indicate that whatever weapon was used went all the way to the handle. Now, the blade on this sword, as we discussed, is almost 12 inches long. If the blade went all the way into the hilt, then that means that it should have gone in at least 12 inches, right? 
the problem? The deepest stab wound that was measured was five and three quarter inches. This means that there's no way that this sword could have caused these particular stab wounds. Now, there's over a dozen stab wounds, so we won't go into each one of them one by one in order not to bore you to death, but let's just suffice it to say that they didn't do a very good job at the autopsy. They actually only measured the depth on approximately five or six of the stab wounds, but the deepest one they measured was five and three quarter inches. Not deep enough for this sword to cause those wounds. The next thing we'll talk about is the shape of the incisions themselves. It's going to be difficult to describe this part over a voice-only podcast, so I'll put pictures of what we're talking about up on the YouTube stream. For those of you only listening on the podcast, I'll do my best to paint a picture for you in your mind. The sword that was found by Brandon's Aunt Kathy was a double-edged, medieval-looking sword much like something you would see King Arthur wielding. So it had a sharp edge on the blade on both sides, coming down to a sharp point at the end of it. It's what's referred to as a double-edged sword. Now, as you can imagine, if you were to stab someone's, let's say, stomach with this sword, you would have an entrance point where the sword broke the skin, and then on each side you would have a very pointed incision mark. As the blade went deeper and deeper into the skin and went further up the sword, that incision would get wider and wider to accommodate the width of the blade, and then the slicing marks that it's making on the way in would stay consistently sharp as each side of the blade forces its way through the skin. The good doctors describe this as a, quote, V-shape incision on each side. So when there's a double-edged sword, there's a V-shape on both sides. So when you put the two together, you really have what resembles kind of a diamond. Two triangles joined together at the base with pointy ends on each side. And it makes sense, right? You have two sharp edges on a blade going through the skin. Each side is going to cut and create an incision. Now, let's look at the wounds on Dennis and Norma. This marks the entrance of our heroine in the story, the forensic pathologist that the defense hired as an expert, Dr. Joy Carter. Just to give some well-deserved accolades to Dr. Carter, at the time, she held medical degrees in four different states, and she was board certified in anatomical pathology, clinical pathology, and forensic pathology. She was an officer in the United States Air Force, where she actually became the deputy chief medical examiner for the entire armed forces. She then moved on to become the chief medical examiner for Washington, D.C., and after four and a half years there, went on to become the chief medical examiner for Harris County in Houston, Texas. She held a few other positions of importance, but I won't bore you with all of her education. Let's just suffice it to say, she knew her shit. If there was a person you wanted on your side when you were fighting for your life, she was the one. All right, so Dr. Carter took the stand and basically blew the state's theory of this being the murder weapon to hell. Remember when the doctors from the Southwestern Institute of Forensic Sciences said that they couldn't really definitively tell whether or not this was the murder weapon, but it was a possibility? Yeah, not so much. Dr. Carter actually stepped in and did the analysis that they should have done, but didn't. She actually compared the suspect's sword to the stab wounds and was just like, what kind of crack are these other doctors smoking? And it starts with the shape of these wounds. The stab wounds that Dr. Carter points out are sharp on one side, but dull on the other. She says that this is indicative of a blade that has a sharp side on one side and a dull side on the other. Typically, when someone is stabbed in their home, this would be consistent with a regular household kitchen knife. If you go and look at any knife that you have in your kitchen, they have a dull edge on one side of the knife and the other side is the sharp part for cutting. Kitchen knives are not made double-edged for safety reasons. But Dr. Carter goes one step beyond this. 
Remember when we talked about the deepest stab wound being five and three quarter inches deep? You know what else has an approximate five to six inch blade? That's right, a normal household kitchen knife. Now, you might think to yourself, well, the Woodruffs were stabbed, so surely the investigators took an inventory of the knives in the kitchen, right? Once again, you would be disappointed. There is no mention anywhere in the investigative reports of checking to see if a knife was missing from the kitchen. Of course, if there was, that wouldn't necessarily exonerate Brandon, but it would at least give the police an actual murder weapon to be searching for because, as I just demonstrated, this sword was most definitely not the murder weapon. Let's listen to how Dr. Carter summarized her testimony. This is direct from the trial transcript. This is Catherine Ferguson questioning Dr. Carter at the end of her testimony. And in viewing the autopsies of Dennis and Norma Woodruff and the stab wounds inflicted on Dennis and Norma Woodruff, would you have been able to form any opinion as to whether or not State's Exhibit 153 is the weapon that inflicted those stab wounds? In my opinion, this is not the weapon that inflicted these wounds. The wounds suggest certainly more than one sharp point weapon. The majority of these wounds have a blunt and a sharp end, which is more characteristic of American stab wounds. And its widest point is not as wide as the wounds that are described to be on the male. And some of the wounds that are described are rectangular, as discussed this afternoon, and are much shorter than this blade would suggest. And even if something like this was driven all the way up to the hilt or guard where it's connected, it would leave a very characteristic pattern on the surface of the skin, which I have not seen described or photographically documented with any of the wounds. And would also the length of the blade seem to suggest or rule it out given the the measurement of the deep stab wounds on Mr. Woodruff's body? In my opinion, yes. And why is that? Well, again, you have a blade that is 12 inches long. You have a maximal wound described as a little over five inches. And again, the shape of the blade, the characteristics of the wound on the external, and what appear to be limited pathways, even though they're not completely dissected, aren't consistent with this type of blade. And are you able to give an opinion with any degree of medical certainty as to whether or not Exhibit 153 is the weapon that inflicted the stab wounds on Dennis and Norma? In my opinion, it's not. This isn't the weapon. And that's, you're giving that with a degree of medical certainty? Yes, I am. Thank you, Doctor. Now, if you were paying especially close attention there, you might have heard Dr. Carter say something that we haven't talked about yet. Some of the stab wounds were indeterminate as to whether or not it was a single-edged blade or a double-edged blade. In other words, she just couldn't tell. That doesn't mean that some of them were made with a double-edged blade. She just couldn't determine with a degree of medical certainty. Of course, the deepest wound, only being five and three-quarter inches deep, still rules out this particular sword. But what it does open the book to is there being a possibility that there could be a second knife used to kill Dennis and Norma. If you'll recall, we talked earlier in the season about the fact that there were at least two murder weapons, a gun and a knife. Then we talked about how the chances of a single perpetrator using two different weapons is somewhere around 10%. Now we're bringing into the equation that there might have been a third murder weapon. Do you know what the chances are statistically of one single assailant using three different murder weapons are? Yes, you're right. It's about, oh, somewhere around zero. All right. That sounds like it's time for a... You guessed it. And now... It's time for a patent-pending Scott Pokensy personal opinion. We're getting close to closing out the season on the Brandon Woodruff case. I promised you in episode one that by the end of this season, you would see everything I see and realize, as well as I do, that Brandon Woodruff 
is a wrongfully convicted inmate wasting away his days in a small jail cell, and that it's for no reason other than a bias on the part of some unfortunate people put in charge of investigations in Hunt County. I believe I've proven to you in this episode that the supposed murder weapon that Brandon's Aunt Kathy found in that barn that day in June of 2008 was not and could not have been the murder weapon. Now, does the fact that this sword was not the murder weapon completely exonerate Brandon? No, it does not. If we're living in a vacuum and there's no other evidence to the contrary, then it would be entirely possible that Brandon was the murderer and he just simply used a different knife, possibly one from the Woodruff's own knife drawer. Or it's possible that Brandon was there and just had the help of multiple other people, which would explain why there were different types of stab wounds. However, the state's theory was that the murder was done by Brandon and Brandon alone, and that he used this sword in the murders. I believe I've shown you enough information so far as to realize that not only was Brandon nowhere near Roy City when his parents were killed, but this particular sword, this particular weapon, was not and could not have been used in this crime. For that reason, among many others, Brandon deserves a new trial. We, as the state of Texas, asked 12 everyday common people to understand and digest the forensics that came along with this weapon, and frankly, it was just too much. It was too overwhelming for them. When I talked to the three jurors that I did, none of them seemed to understand what I was talking about when I discussed this part of the case with them. They didn't understand it then, and they didn't understand it at trial. When we pick a jury out of the population in general, you may get an engineer and you may get a high school dropout. You never know. And in this particular case, with this particular issue, it was just too much for them to understand. I'll save all of my real scathing opinions for the last episode of season one just four weeks from now. Until then, here's a sneak peek from next week's episode where we start covering the trial. Until then, remember to stay aware, stay strong, and get involved. See you next week. On March 5th, 2009, Brandon Woodruff finally went on trial for capital murder, nearly three and a half years after Brandon was arrested. Now equipped with high-powered seasoned prosecutors from the Attorney General's office in Austin, the state of Texas was ready for battle in small-town Greenville. Philip Crawford Jr. wrote about the potential jury pool in his book, Railroaded. The jury pool was comprised largely of Christian evangelicals, and the hostility against homosexuality was open and unapologetic. One individual said, I wouldn't have a high opinion of gay people, and I would pray for them. Another said, I just have a less opinion of them which possibly would make him more likely to think they're not truthful. Sure, the chosen ones all gratuitously represented that a defendant's homosexuality would not weigh into their decision on guilt or innocence. But would it be okay to impanel eight avowed white supremacists or Nazi sympathizers in a criminal trial involving a black or Jewish defendant? And yet eight Texans who, by their own admission, viewed homosexuals as morally inferior to heterosexuals were allowed onto the jury panel to judge a gay boy. 